There are so many pieces of media from my childhood I could say defined my love of horror growing up, but when I think about my first memories and possibly where it all began, what immediately comes to mind is the movie Slugs, a different story for a different day, and Killing Time. This is easily the most bizarre fever dream game I remember growing up. Back in the late 90s, early 2000s, I used to go into my dad's office where he would typically have the latest Apple computer. You know, back when we called them Macintosh? Uh, I even vividly remember the family computer being the Bondi Blue iMac. Christ, I feel old. However, it was the collection of game demos from magazines like Mac Addict and Macworld where Killing Time made its nightmare impression on me. Now, admittedly, I never actually played the full game, because besides never having a PC and Mac OS games being super hard to find, I was also a baby when it initially released and didn't discover it until the turn of the millennium. But nonetheless, this bad boy was the PT of my childhood, and I never forgot about it. Throughout my many years consuming horror, I was always reminded of it from time to time, and a few years ago, I finally watched a playthrough to at least experience it secondhand. However, what always stood out to me was not simply its grotesque and absurdist evil dead like spirits, demons, and zombies, but how remarkably involved and lore heavy its story was. Recently, Night Dive Studios have been feeding my childhood horror gaming nostalgia by remastering Shadow Man and the yet to release The Thing, and remaking System Shock, three games I loved growing up but admittedly never finished because I was too young and too stupid to understand their old school obtuse game design, and now, out of nowhere, they're dropping a remaster of Killing Time just in time for Halloween. Now, here's the thing, I never ask for review codes, although developers, if you are watching and you want to send me free stuff, I'll happily take it, nudge nudge wink wink, but Night Dive Studios did reach out to me on Twitter and provide me with a review code, so I felt curious to check it out. Although I feel for transparency's sake, I should clarify, I am not being paid to promote it, these are entirely my honest opinions. Also, with this being my first game review in quite a while, I should reinstate that it's always been a rule of thumb on this channel that everything be accepted as a spoiler, so you've been warned. Killing Time tells the story of a remote island off the coast of Mian called Matinicus, which is privately owned by a greedy, occult-obsessed Harris called Tess Conway. In 1932, during an extravagant party on the night of the summer solstice, Tess, her guests, friends, acquaintances, and staff all mysteriously disappeared, and the island has long been abandoned ever since, as though separated from time and space. You play as an archaeology student who arrives on the island in search of a mystical water clock that was stolen by Tess with the help of a trigger-happy gangster called Duncan DeVries. It's explained by your Egyptology professor Dr. Hargrove that, for many years, Tess financed his expeditions to Northern Africa under the belief that the water clock from the dynasty of Pharaoh Ramses was said to grant eternal life. But of course, no great fortune comes without its own sinister caveats. You discover almost immediately that for several decades, the island has existed in its own inescapable vortex where time stands still, and its victims roam the island as restless zombies and spirits, just waiting for someone to finally put them at peace. If you couldn't tell from that synopsis, Killing Time has a remarkably meaty plot that's fascinating, original, and arguably stands head and shoulders above many other horror game narratives, even today. And yes, I will be getting into the nitty gritty of it later in the video. To put these spirits to rest, your goal is to simply collect ten vessels that contain the essence of Tess Conway in the symbolic form of various body parts that were scattered around the island by our consulting archaeologist Byron so nobody could harness the power for themselves. Besides eight arbitrarily coloured keys and invitation to get inside the mansion, you can freely explore the entire island out the gate, with the story itself being delivered non-chronologically via FMV apparitions that give us small glimpses into the characters and their motivations visions that slowly build up a surprisingly complex picture of what happened before your arrival. The gameplay is basically Wolfenstein 3D. It's a 90s boomer shooter where you spend your time mowing down anything that moves with a small arsenal of weapons while discovering keys and secrets to progress. It even has its own version of the BFG in the form of the hieroglyphic ank, which is supposed to symbolize life, but ironically eviscerates all life in your vicinity. 
Now, this is where things get interesting, because while you might say, Ryan, that is a very specific reference, what's so incredibly striking about all the various items, enemies, and environments is that they're all thoughtfully contextualized within the story. For example, if you're nitpicky enough to ask why there are tons of guns and bullets scattered all over the island, and in particular, Molotov cocktails, well, it's established early on that Duncan was a prominent bootlegger who moved into arms smuggling as the Prohibition era began to fizzle out, and Tess allowed him and his henchmen to use the island to store their shipments and act as their base of operations. Hell, in the basement, you'll find yourself fighting angry prohibitionists who throw fucking alcohol at you. The variety of ghosts, skeletons, zombies, ghouls, bugs, and flying nimbus heads all have their own little backstory or reason for existing. The bugs are a reference to the butler Robert trying to deal with a botched pest extermination. The beetles and the nimbus heads are an obvious reference to the sacred and cursed Egyptian artifacts planted around the island. And there's even a burning room filled with skeletons that smoke cigarettes because Robert explains it's a designated smoking lounge. It's vividly absurd, yet strangely, it all makes sense. Byron is even mad at Robert for flushing his preserved scarab beetle dung balls down the toilet, and what seems random at first ends up being the main enemy you fight in the sewers. Nothing feels like it simply exists so you can shoot it. It goes out of its way to flesh out a true house of haunted attractions with environmental storytelling, and an extra beauty of the remaster is that it includes behind the scenes features that demonstrate just how intricate everything is. The guest rooms comprise of overworked, rightfully pissed off, angry maids who just want to punch you in the fucking face, while you're warned by Robert that the chefs feel the same way in the kitchen because they're under fire cooking for smug, rich, elitist party guests. And lastly, you have clowns, oh my god, the clowns, hired by tests that literally tickle you to death, and you will come to loathe them so much, the game even gives you an achievement for killing every single one of them. Seriously, there are so many fucking clowns. Honestly, I was expecting a more traditional arcade horror like House of the Dead or Clown Evil, but it's so artistically crafted in how it begins as a brooding atmospheric survival horror, with the bootleggers, duck hunters, and zombie gardeners that emerge from the darkness, until unraveling into the more comical and campy elements, as though transitioning from Evil Dead to Evil Dead 2. The only real tangible issue I had with the gameplay is that much like Shadow Man and System Shock, while your objective is simple, how you complete it is an entirely different story. The game is essentially broken up into a sparse overworld with unique biomes containing claustrophobic dungeon-like labyrinths that can be incredibly confusing to navigate and especially during backtracking become very easy to get lost in. There is a real-time map that highlights interactive elements that help unlock secret doors and passages to find the next item, but it's relatively restrictive so you still have to orientate yourself to figure out just where exactly you are, which I guess makes it more immersive but less so when you're just trying to get out of the fucking basement. I'll admit I'm not conditioned enough to these types of old school games, but as a filthy casual, it is a brain melter trying to remember which rooms I'd fully completed and which I needed to re-explore later when I had the right key, and that's besides the fact I sometimes forgot just why I was in a certain area to begin with. Once I found a key or vessel, my inherent instinct was to assume I had completed the level, and since some of the items are in easy to miss areas, I ended up bum rushing around the map several times looking for that one key or vessel I missed. In fact, it took me over four Four hours to complete the game, and I would argue nearly two of those hours were spent backtracking. In retrospect of my own incompetency and bad memory, I wished I noted things down, in particular these magic doors, since you'll need to access them to complete the endgame objective once you find all ten vessels. Because if you think destroying the water clock would be that simple, well, let's talk about the plot and endgame. Spoilers, obviously. So, when you first encounter Tess's spirit, she pleads with you to recover the vessels and release her soul, so she can banish the evil that's insinuated to be the result of Duncan trying to take the power for himself. However, it quickly becomes clear that she's not exactly the innocent victim she likes to paint herself as, as various apparitions show that her efforts to achieve immortality and retain her beauty and youth through the water clock involve selfishly using everyone around her, which they slowly became aware of, particularly Duncan and Byron. Duncan sees himself as a cunning mastermind in his own right, trying to manipulate Tess so that he can use her power and wealth in society to 
to further his own business empire and even potentially legitimize it, only for her to constantly sidestep his proposals. The thing about Byron is that he's the only one who is aware of the inherent evil of the water clock, but is ultimately blinded by his own hopeless attraction to Tess, and thinks that by helping her she'll fall in love with him and they'll be together for eternity. While the triangle between Byron, Tess, and Duncan's separate delusions escalates the evil of the water clock as if it's feeding on their desires, the subplots focus on the victims caught in the crossfire. The butler Robert is perhaps the most tragic character in the story, as he slowly reveals how devastated and depressed he's become, witnessing Tess become consumed by darkness and greed, having looked after her since she was a child. His thoughts about Tess's former innocence then seem to reflect onto her niece Angela, who attempts to help the player on several occasions. The least interesting but still thoughtful subplot involves Tess's friend Lydia, who becomes so envious of Tess that she attempts to mimic her appearance and later takes advantage of the same people Tess does in a bid to tarnish her legacy. Tess eventually agrees to Byron's plans to preserve her power by reverse engineering a similar ritual used by the goddess Isis to resurrect her husband Osiris, the god of resurrection and the afterlife, whose body was dismembered by his evil brother Seth after he killed him. Tess has her spiritual essence transferred into ten vessels to simulate the body parts of Osiris, that when brought back together resurrected him, with Tess's intention being being so that if she died, nobody could harness the power for themselves. Byron, however, explains that the main reason for doing this is to expand the radius of the water clock's power by distributing the vessels facing the clock, thus creating the time-stopping vortex around the island to preserve her immortality. Eventually, you follow a secret chamber to Tess's attic, where it's revealed that after Tess rejected Duncan's proposal of marriage, he fatally stabbed her, causing her to use her dying breath to curse Duncan with the evil spirit of Seth, who after confronting him, turned him into this thing. I am now the avatar of Set, ruler of the night. Your soul belongs to me. Granted, it is spoiled by being on the cover of the game, but this Frankenstein spine-wielding Hulk and Nemesis thing now pursues you through the map as you attempt to destroy six other clocks to weaken the water clock's defenses and finally kill Seth slash Duncan once and for all. He is easy to avoid and can be briefly stunned, but on harder difficulties, it is quite stressful seeing him spawn in a narrow hallway while blitzing your way through each part of the mansion. After you finally destroy the clock and Tess's spirit is unleashed, she finishes off Duncan and reveals that she no longer needs the clock to retain her power because, like everyone else around her, you've been manipulated to helping her achieve immortality and your reward is to spend eternity on the island with the rest of her monstrosities. Unless you're stocked up on Duncan's Molotov cocktails and a flamethrower, in which case she goes down pretty fucking easily. If you enjoyed this video as much as I did making it, I would love to do more like it, but as you can imagine with video games, it takes a lot more work to make a video like this, so your engagement, liking, commenting, and sharing the video genuinely helps me out. But until next time, stay safe, stay away from cursed Egyptian artifacts, and I'll see you all very soon. Bye. This time trapped I'll where time has ceased to be if you must know